Welcome to the number three version of IoT Recruiting Podcast. We're pleased to be joined today by David Oro, Editor-in-Chief of IoT Central. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me, Bill. No problem. Could you tell us a little bit about you and your work with IoT Central, David, and then potentially your interest and affiliation with smart cities? Sure, no problem. Uh, so I am the editor of IoT Central, which is an industrial IoT community. We're different from normal uh, news sites in the fact that we are community-driven and community-based. We have about 8,000 uh, community members on our website now, all focused on everything in the industrial IoT. So our members contribute blogs, jobs, discussions, uh, things like that is what we focus on. And we've been at it for about two years or so, and it's a great community and a lot of members um continually write insightful content um, and share their perspective on, on on being an IoT professional. I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit as we go forward. But one of the things that we do focus on on our website a lot is smart cities. It's a natural fit for industrial IoT. Implementing IoT in the city um, and using these things to create smarter connected cities uh, is is a great case study for where IoT will be headed in the near future. Could you give us a, an idea of, of smart cities, uh, your perspective, based on the things you've, you've written about and stuff like that? And what are the vision and benefits of smart cities as you see it? Well, cities are where the majority of people will live. And by 2050, some estimate estimate and predict that as many as 7 out of 10 people on Earth will live in an urban area. It's a lot of people. You've seen these in the megatropolises of Asia where a city like Manila in the Philippines, there's 100 million in that city and like 20, 30 million of them live right there in the Manila area. These continued population increases will exceed the capacity of human in administrators. And, and what I mean by that is that those are the people that are in your city hall, the people that are doing your public works and picking up your trash. Cities are just going to, ha with that many people, cities are just going to have to get a whole lot smarter to drive efficiencies. And the way that they can do that is through, you know, some technology. Think about solar-powered Wi-Fi connected trash cans to let collectors know when they are full. No longer do they have to do a round, and when they go around, they'll hit an empty trash can. They'll just hit the full ones and empty those. Sensors to alert public works of clogged sewers or traffic cameras connected to an IP network to notify engineers of mounting traffic jams. These are the kinds of things that cities are looking for to, to make quality of life a little bit better. And in the end, these technologies, smart city technologies, IoT technologies, will usher in a new era of more efficient and responsive government. And all of it's driven by real-time data. The benefits are many here. It's increased cost savings, bolstered civil, civic engagement, and a strengthened public health and safety network, I think, will come. And that's what I kind of see happening when we make our cities a bit smarter. That's very interesting. I hadn't heard about the trash can one, David. Because we, we hear a lot about the lighting. We hear a lot about some of those kind of things. But, but that's a new one on me. Yeah, I saw one at a trade show, and I, I spent 30 minutes with the guy trying to figure out <laughs> the benefits of it. And they even have some of them that are, like, buried into the ground, and it's – not like a normal looking trash can and you need a, a big machine and a certain kind of truck to take it out, but it, it, it was a lot more aesthetic. You know, initially we heard a lot of emphasis on smart cities like overseas in places like United Arab Emirates, Dubai, London, Tokyo. Are, are you seeing a lot more interest in the U.S. and, and are, are you seeing a lot more potential cities taking advantage of some of these technologies and doing projects? What do you see on that front? Well, you're right. A lot of it is happening overseas, but really it, this is a global game. Uh, the, there's an organization here in the U.S. called the National League of Cities, and they re published a report last year called Trends in Smart City Development, and they showcased five cities. Four out of the five cities were here in the United States. Those were Philadelphia, San Francisco, Chicago, Charlotte, and New Delhi, and the only one that was outside of the country was New Delhi um, in India. And there's places in New York. There's, uh, there's New York, there's Toronto, I think L.A. has a program, and there's plenty of smart city uh, contests that are being held, um, funded by the U.S. Uh, government to try to jumpstart or get these smart city initiatives going. What I didn't tell you at the intro of our call, Bill, in addition to being the editor at IoT Central, I live in a town called American Canyon, which is in Napa Valley, California. I happen to sit on the city council. I'm a council member here. Uh, one of my big things here is to look at ways to 
It's make a land your own smart city yeah, program, right? Exactly. Yeah. We are a small municipality. We're only about 20,000 people, and we're the gateway to Napa Valley. You start here, and then you go up to Napa um, and then the, the famous wine-growing regions. But because we're at this gateway, and we're at the – I like to say that we are at the, at the edge of the urban bay and at the foot of Napa Valley. Everybody comes through town on a Highway 29 to get to Napa Valley, and we ha- we have our fair share of traffic. And one of the things that we're looking at is what I talked about earlier: an IP network to notify engineers of mounting traffic jams. It's not really engineers; it's actually going to be smart sensors. And we're taking a look at the traffic, and we're looking at the feeder streets off of the highway. How many cars do we let through, and how many times do we let those feeder streets begin to feed the highway as well? That's something that we're working on. We're hoping to implement that this year. Um, it's it's great to be able to tie in the work that I'm doing with IoT and working with our city administration to think about and implement smart city technologies. That's very interesting, David. You have your own projects. That's very interesting. <laughs> Multiple. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the challenges you see to adoption to some of these projects? And, and what are the, potentially some of the things that you've faced in kind of getting one off the ground and, and getting it, you know, bringing it from, uh, to fruition? Yeah, so there is a blog post that was put up last week. Again, I'm fighting your listeners to come out here and check out IoT Central. There was a gentleman by the name of Andrew Hamilton who wrote a piece called Welcoming the Urban Ford Auto. And he was looking at what urban is he looked at the history of urbanization from when we first came over in history and what happened with the general direction of um, people clamoring together to be in more urban areas. He did a 2.0, which was the earliest 20th century when we were trying to plan these cities. Um, 3.0 was the beginning of the 21st century. We're starting to add computing and automation. And he was arguing next to it's time to go to the next level, which he's calling an urban 4.0, the Internet of Things that enables residents, planners to monitor and adjust to the urban infrastructure. And he laid out, uh, I think it was four things that were both things that you needed to do and four things that I that are challenges for city. The first was, what is the city's main goal or identity? Here that I just described in the city of American Canyon, I really need to get traffic through this town, particularly during rush hour. So we're looking at traffic. But what are those cities? What it, maybe some other cities are looking at improving um, livability or making it easier for businesses to operate. Uh, that's the kind of thing. Or maybe they want to drive their economy. So these are the things to look at. The second thing, and this is more of a bureaucratic thing, and I think when you think about smart cities or cities in general or even government, there is still continued bureaucracy involved in this whole thing. And I know that as a private um, well, lifetime private sector employee come, going into the public sector and public service, I cannot get as, as many things done as fast as I want to as, as if I was a private enterprise. There's laws and there's rules and there's public funds involved before you go about spending that. But Andrew Hamilton in this blog post said we need to rethink the RFP relationships with vendors. And you've seen this at, at the federal sure. level as well. You want to move more quickly and be more agile, but there's a process of a 30-day comment period. There's a 30-day review then that's opened up for six. You know, these are hard things to get through. So sometimes the structure gets in the way, and particularly when you're looking at IoT and smart cities or smart cities in general. Um, it's not – you're not going to have one vendor for everything. You may have multiple vendors. That trash can vendor is different from the traffic vendor. The water sewer vendor is, is different from the parks vendor. So these are the kinds of things that we need to be able to look at from an integrated relationship with the vendors as for cities. Um, he also argued focus on transfer, uh, transformational improvements. Transformational in my town is traffic. Other towns have political and budgetary pressures. You may It may be cool to throw in and get the um, cool trash can that tells you when the thing is full, but is that really transformational to your city? You have to think, if you're going to do this, do this big and do this well. There's an article in the New York Times this weekend about Sidewalk Labs in the city of Toronto. Sidewalk Labs is an alphabet company, a.k.a. Google, and Sidewalks has been looking at about 800 acres uh, of underused waterfront to be reimagined as a neighborhood, and I think they're starting from scratch there, to create a full map around this section of Toronto. This is something that I think Toronto's is forward, leaking, uh, forward thinking in that can actually be transformational in that area. Um, if you haven't been to, to Toronto, Toronto is a great city already. I don't know about now in the middle of winter, but it's a great city all the rest of the time. 
And then finally, he was talking about, uh, Andrew's post was talking about reassessing a citywide approach. Um, you know, not just in a single mixed use development, uh, but like, how can you look at this across holistically in a s- super city? In the end, uh, there's a technology out there. There's some integration that needs to be done. There's a bureaucratic barriers that still need to exist. But I think everybody's moving forward to creating better and smarter cities. That's very interesting, David. Who was the person that did the post again? And, and could you give us a reference to your site in terms of the URL if people want to? Yeah, do that? so, yeah, our, the website is uh, iotcentral.io. Uh, www.iotcentral.io, uh, preparing for an urban 4.0 future written by Andrew Hamilton. Uh, and he is part of, I think, I can't remember where he worked. Oh, he is with Hitachi. Uh, so we have a lot of professionals contributing to our site, so come check it out. That's super. David, thank you very much for all your information today, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and continuing with IoT Central. And it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. It's, it's been fun. Thanks for having me, Bill.